Huge show on the way. Harry, how are you, sir, this morning? I've been better. I've been better. What do you want me to say? Um, As nightmares go, is that right up there? Unai Emery, uh, Emmy Martin. Just straight into it. Aston Villa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just straight in. Yeah, just, just start throwing darts at me straight away before we've even got going. Do you know what? There was a few people that messaged me last night. I'm not saying, obviously, I'm big time or anything. But a couple of that saying, just make sure Harry knows about Emmy Martin and Unai Emery. So I thought I'd get out of the way straight away, Harry. <laughs> Listen, we'll get into it. We'll get into the it. Chat, the chat Congratulations popping, to Aston Villa. We'll get into it. Yeah. Ollie Clink, yeah. Jacob Culture, Harry Simu, Scott Saunders. Ollie. It's so lovely to see you again, mate. Um, we've gone from a brick wall with you, as we have with Scott, Harry, and myself. I to, thought I was like a metaphor. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> at the back, yeah. um, how are you, sir? I've it's had an to am- see you. I mean, I feel bad for Harry, but I had an amazing weekend. Uh, Did you? Newcastle batted Spurs, West Ham lost, Man United drew. Sorry, Scott. Um, and then I backed the winner of the Grand National and the winner of the Masters. Goodness what me. a weekend. Wow. There's nothing to be said so about that. So you are a betting man? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Usually badly. <laughs> so I, yeah, I it's for a change. On, it was good. I had a go on the Grand National and my horse fell on the first fence. Oh, oh, that's the what a sign that was. I should have known. <laughs> do, you know what, <laughs> going. do you know what really annoys me about people who bet on the Grand National is when they bet on half the field and then end up Getting a third place, they go, yeah, I definitely didn't do that. I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seven, eight places. Scott, did you bet on the Grand National? I did not this week. Uh, this week, usually this do week. this weekend. I usually do this. Ah, give it, give it rest. How was your weekend? Oh, Harry's wasn't great. Fantastic. Outside of watching Man United, whatever that is, uh, decent weekend. Decent weekends. Yeah. Nice, mm-hmm. sweet. Mm-hmm. Lots to cover. We're going to be touching on the top race: Arsenal and Liverpool. Obviously, Arsenal near Western Villa two. Liverpool losing to Crystal Palace. City, it does feel like the title is just swaying towards them slightly, well I say slightly, quite significantly. We'll be touching, as Ollie said, on, on Spurs Newcastle as well, and then finishing off with a bit of, of United meltdown. So the first thing to do is make sure to leave a like on the video, subscribe to Nighty Min, follow the guys on their social channels, turn your post notifications and share this video with as many people as possible. Before we do start today, we wanted to take a moment uh, to remember the 97 on the 35th anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster. Our thoughts to everyone here at 90 Min today are with all those affected by the tragedy on the 15th of April 1989. Um, no football fan should go to a game and not return home. So thoughts to everyone uh, with them today. OK, let's start with Arsenal, Harry. It, was, uh, it just oh. felt like a familiar sinking feeling watching this Arsenal team. And I, I don't want to compare to last season, but I'm going to anyway. That Southampton game at home last season, it did feel like the way it ended... Although it's probably slightly different stages in the title race, it felt like that was the moment where Arsenal maybe just lost a little bit in this title race. And it felt like for me yesterday that Arsenal lost the grip a little bit in terms of morale, in terms of spirit, and in terms of what that meant for the whole picture. Am I wrong to think that? No, um, I have to say that I've been saying for a while that I don't make Arsenal favourites to win the league. And everyone keeps trying to get me to say it, but the reason I didn't You're say two it... two points off. Yeah, we are two points two. off and we're still in it, obviously. But yesterday felt like a defeat that not only impacted the Premier League table, but impacted us psychologically. I think had Liverpool gone top of the league, I think that would have been better for us than it being Manchester City. So you what you think the pressure of Liverpool losing got to Arsenal? No, no, no. I, like, I was at the game yesterday, right? And I was sitting there and, and there was a load of Arsenal fans watching it in the concourse, the Liverpool game. And when the final whistle went, there were cheers all around the stadium. And I thought to myself, actually, this doesn't change anything. Because Man City have got three points on the board. So you still need to go out there and win. And even if you do win, you've not shaken off Manchester City, who, in my opinion, are the biggest problem in this title race. Mm. They're so inevitable, Manchester City, that you felt like if they were able to get their noses in front at any point between the last couple of weeks and and the end of the season, that they're going to go on and win it. And that's why I'm pretty sure they're going to go on and win it now. I think for me, the big frustration yesterday was just sort of the second half performance. You know, the first half, I thought Arsenal were okay. Not at their brilliant best, but did create chances, did cut through Aston Villa at points. And then the second half started and it was as if somebody just switched off the lights. Like, there was no energy, there was no uh, cohesion to the team. I think Mikel Arteta, probably in hindsight, would look back and think he picked the wrong team. Um, In what sense? In what sense? In the sense of, he took the decision to drop Kai Havertz back into midfield. Now, Kai Havertz hasn't been anywhere near as impactful playing in that position. We saw it in the first half of the season. So to take that decision to drop him back there and play a Gabriel Jesus, who in my opinion looks nowhere near fit enough, um, was a mistake. Zinchenko at left back. It's an accident waiting to happen unless you're so dominant that Zinchenko can go into the midfield all the time. And to be fair, in the first half, he'd done that and he played quite well in the first half. 
Aren't, the, aren't these the two people you signed from Man City to get you over the line in title races, though? Well, they're two people that came in and up the level. And whether you think they're good enough now or not, that's undeniable. They did. Gabriel Jesus and Zinchenko coming in last season was a huge boost. The problem is, is that Gabriel Jesus is nowhere near fit. He's been talking himself this week about the knee problem that he's got ongoing, that he's struggling with it. And Zinchenko, when you've got loads of the ball, fine. But the minute you, you start to lose a bit of territory, you can't have him at left back. Because that's what Villa did so well. Unai Emery did two things at half time, and Unai Emery deserves immense praise yep. after that yesterday because what he did was suss out where Arsenal's weaknesses were and how Arsenal were causing his team problems. And he took steps way before Mikel Arteta to try and change the course of the game, and it worked. How painful was that to say? Just sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> Come on, listen, talk to us. <laughs> open up. Listen, I've always said that Unai Emery is a good manager. He just wasn't the right fit for Arsenal. And I still believe that Unai Emery as a manager has a ceiling. And at Aston Villa, his ceiling is more than good enough. Mm. That's the difference. At Arsenal, it wasn't. But he, he realised in the first half that Arsenal were cutting through those sort of... What, what was happening was the distance between Villa's midfield and defence was too big. And so when Arsenal were getting the ball back, Zinchenko especially, he's very good at doing this, was popping the ball through the lines and then Odegaard would get it and turn and charge at the Villa defence. And then you've got Saka coming up on your right, Trossard on your left, Havertz coming um, through the middle as well. There were options there because Arsenal were cutting through those spaces. Emery realised that. And if you look at the average positions <coughs> of the Villa team in the first half, versus the second half, the distances between each of their lines were significantly smaller. And that was the difference. And then he also took the decision to say to Moussa Diaby, who had been quite defensive, I thought, in the first period at times, forget that, you're going to go and pin Zinchenko back now. Because if you pin Zinchenko back, then that stops Arsenal getting him into midfield and being that little bit more creative. So that's what he did. You make Alexander Zinchenko play left back, he's got a problem because he isn't a left back. Mm. And, and and Villa was spot on with that. They were physically better. And considering they played on Thursday, you know, that's incredible from them. They deserve so, so much praise yesterday. But from an Arsenal point of view, you can't help but feel disappointed. We've had a super chat from, from Sean. He says, I think it was less about Arsenal and Liverpool bottling it. And it was more about them running out of steam. Both teams looked tired and out of ideas. I just wanted to go back on to the Arteta-Emery chat. And we will do a section on Aston Villa and Emery and how good a job he's he's doing this season. It looks like they've got a really strong chance of getting that fourth position, Scott. Was it a case of Emery outclassing Mikel Arteta yesterday? Yes, I think so. Um, there's a lot to maybe read into the fact obviously you mentioned there that Aston Villa played Thursday um, and Arsenal played Tuesday last week but in terms of the mental demand <laughs> you know on Arsenal went into that game against Bayern as a lot of people's favourites it was not always going to be that easy Bayern are very experienced in Europe and the way that that they got outplayed that night as well for me and I think this week now you'll I don't see, agree with that I, I think they did I think they, I think they were quite lucky um, but you know, Arsenal have when you have that um, that a small squad of players, and you you go into a Champions League game, which is just a massive deal for you, and you're trying to balance that and the Premier League alongside it. When you're challenging for your first title in 20 years, it's a lot to deal with mentally uh, as well as physically. And you can criticize him for the changes that he made, but if you're at the top and trying to compete in two, two competitions, you've got to expect that your players who are coming in from the bench are able to do the job to keep the level up. So I think. Emery bided his time. I think he looked at what was happening in the game, made the right changes, and Aston Villa turned it up. And I feel like they hit the post twice, remember, mm. as well. I know Arsenal had their own chances, but Villa had a, a fair few good chances. And Emery has proven over a number of years, regardless of the clubs he's working with, that he can always upset the odds. And I feel like he's got good experience and manager of the season for me. I think that's the one thing you say about that Leon Bailey goal, Ollie. It felt like it was coming for half an hour in that second half, really. Yeah. Um, I guess the big question, and people will say it's brutal because Arsenal have been excellent over the course of this season and by no means is the title race done, even though I think some people might think it is, even that two-point gap. And we've all seen this movie before with Manchester City where they just go on and, and get the job done. But it goes back maybe to what we've seen last season and maybe what we've seen this season. When things got big, did Arsenal shrink, in your opinion? It's just so tough, isn't it? Because they are coming up. <laughs> <laughs> it was all a bit arsenal -y, wasn't it? Wait, um, it? We do have to... No, I mean, but, it's almost the elephant in the room, isn't it? In terms, sorry, Ollie. Uh, no, I was just going to say, 
I understand what you're saying there, but it's so tough when you're coming up against perfection in Manchester City, even when they've had difficult moments this season, the way they react. What is it now? Something like 27 games unbeaten in all competitions as well. They're so, so difficult to, to move as, as, a, as a mountain of a club. So it, it, it is tough though, because I was at, I remember being at Arsenal Brighton actually. Everyone talks about that Southampton game, but that was the proper day where it was all over pretty much for, for Arsenal. And I felt like, yes, that game against Aston Villa felt a bit more like that, where even the Emirates, you know, was completely deflated by the end. They realised that this tight race, even though there's still only two points in it, it's just so difficult when you're coming up against Manchester City. Is it fair to say that it's Arsenal's fault for being up against such unbelievable opponents? It's so difficult to win the Premier League. I'm just trying to cheer up Harry, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but Do you know what, though, Harry? I, I don't quite think it's fair to look at Arsenal and say this is a team that always bottles it in the in the in the big moments. No, very true. I mean the thing is though, Harry, if I'm thinking of sort of trends from the buying game and I'm thinking of trends from the Aston Villa game. The buying game that Arsenal didn't lose. The buying game that Arsenal didn't yeah. lose. But we're not, we're not was, talking about were, the result. People not, expected Arsenal to beat Bayern in the week. But I I don't think it, it's it's not the fact that it but was isn't that a sign of where Arsenal have been over the last year that people oh, but, expected. Yeah for that. sure, but when it matters could they get the job done? And maybe well, they got a Munich and win. Maybe they do. It's half time in that tie. Like if Arsenal lose the tie, by all means, pile in on them for for Bayern. But to pile in on them about Bayern when it's half time in the tie is ridiculous. My point wasn't about the result, Harry. It was more about the patterns from the Bayern game, the Aston Villa game. Even when you go back to the West Ham game at her, a home earlier on in the season, teams sitting deeper and playing on the break, and Arsenal have failed to deal with that tactic it, it, on a few occasions this season, You're Harry. jumping to a conclusion based on one result. I'm not one result, you, though. No, but it is. Because if you look at 2024, Arsenal have played 12 league games, won 10, drawn one, lost one. That's an incredible return. That's an it unbelievable is, but at, at, return. At the point in the season when it matters most. No, but it's but this is the point. You're making it a big... Because of the point of the season it's at, you're making it into a massive deal. When If Arsenal go and lose the next game, if they go and drop points against Wolves, then we can start having the chat about have the wheels come off at the business end of the season. You can't do that off the back of a one-off result, mm. is my point. That is disrespectful to the progress that Arsenal have made over the last two years. I don't mind people saying they were crap on the day because they were. I don't mind people saying that defensively they've lost their way a little bit. I have no issue with that whatsoever. But it's such a lazy narrative. Bottled it, bottled it. Anytime someone drops points in football, they've bottled it apparently. But Harry, I, 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 haven't, I haven't said Arsenal bottled it. All you I'm said saying... they shrunk. No, no, it's the so question. You're, you're no, no. suggesting. Whoa, 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 Harry, Harry, Harry. No, no, no. You, you, you it was a question to Ollie. You used the word shrink. Yeah, it was a question right, to so Ollie. It, it was so a question to Ollie if, if they did in that moment. If they did in that moment. All I was saying was there were trends in three games this season West Ham at home, Bayern in the Champions League, and Aston Villa yesterday, where teams have sat deep, played in the break, and Arsenal have struggled to deal with that tactic. I that did, is a fact. I did feel during that game that when it got to half time at 0 0, and I thought Arsenal were way too scruffy in a way and in front of goal as well but I felt the fact that they hadn't got themselves in front was a problem in that game and and does, I don't know if that does say a lot about what you've just said there that when Arsenal struggled to break a team down I just felt like you said it was inevitable in the end that Aston Villa were going to take the lead it was when, as soon as Villa took the lead you didn't think Arsenal were going to get back into it you thought Villa mm. would get a second and that's no, what they're they're fans. Walking. yeah what do we what do we think I, I thought honestly Jakey d- to leave at 2-0 or whenever they started leaving I looked at the clock, it was like 94, 95 minutes and the stadium was half empty. After, as Harry points out rightly, Arsenal's season has been absolutely fantastic in terms of the the fact that they've put themselves in the position where they're in a title race. And the one time in the league that you disappoint, your players disappoint, you're not there to back them. It's, uh, to me, that's really poor. Really, really poor. Harry, you're probably the best person to speak I agree with this. that. I agree with that. I, I didn't like that. I hated the fact that I was looking up and seeing the far side of the stadium where you know when you're it's right in front of you it's difficult to tell how many people have left but when you look across mm. at the other side you can really see it yeah I was disappointed in that and I thought that was a bit of a letdown considering that this team have been as good as they have been this season like back your team a little bit I hate yeah. that. It, it, it doesn't make like, sense you, know, you can see the Chelsea Man United game the other day where they scored in the what like 100 and well, 100th minute, 99th just before that as well. Stay to the end because yeah. you don't know what's going to happen with this added time also, with everything that's going on. Also, 94th minute. If Arsenal go and get a goal from a corner or something exactly. like that, you've got another three minutes. To, yeah. And there's eight minutes of added time yeah. to mm, potentially yeah. get back in it. And like, you know, 
in that situation, a big roar from the crowd can mean that things can turn around. We've had a super chat from Nachi Ket. Thanks so much, mate. Uh, four and a half seasons and one FA Cup. If not this season, then when will this Arsenal team win anything significant? £700 million spent and nothing to show for it. Again, I don't know, Harry, if you have a response to, to that super chat from Nachi Ket. Just throwing out nonsense numbers. Um, out of nowhere and just coming up with oh yeah they've only won one FA Cup sorry we're back in the Champions League for the first time and we're in the quarterfinals and we're going to Munich on Wednesday and could potentially book ourselves a place if Arsenal finished second this year and got to the Champions League semi-final that would be a better season than last season so that would show that they've moved forward again you, this idea that you can just come in out of nowhere and topple Manchester City is mad how many league titles has Jurgen Klopp won? There's a reason for that. Because we'll get on to that. There's a reason for that. <laughs> because Manchester City are an incredible side. Now, I'm not going to be that guy that sits there and goes, Manchester City are this and Manchester City are that. Let the, let the investigation happen. Whatever happens, happens, right? But that is a big asterisk next to their name as well. And, and we can't completely brush that under the carpet. So, look, I, we were poor yesterday. The second half was really, really disappointing. I did think Mikel Arteta probably got it wrong. I thought the decision to change the midfield is ultimately what cost us because we lost that battle, especially in the second half. And after the second half started, Villa was were growing in confidence with every passing minute. And you could see that. I agree with you guys that it felt like Villa were more likely to get the winner. They were well on top. Yeah. But it, this idea that Arsenal just bottled it and the, the title's gone and they've bottled it, to me, it's just typical of today's kind of social media. Let's jump on a narrative. Let's make stuff I up. Don't, I don't... Th I'm sorry, Oli, go on. You, you go no, no, I was just going to say it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think if you looked at Man United last season who got in the top four and got and won the League Cup, Arsenal last season, you know, battled so hard for the league. But as you say, Harry, if they come second and then get into the Champions League semi-final compared to if, let's say, I don't know, Man United comes seventh and maybe win the FA Cup, I still think you would say, even if they won that trophy, Manchester United have had an awful season compared to last season because of how bad they've been in the league. Do you always have to get a trophy in the cabinet to prove that you've improved as a club? No, I don't you don't. Think you, do. you don't. And th the thing is, I wouldn't bet against City winning the treble again, which tells you again about the distance between them and everybody else. We're all sitting here saying, oh, it's inevitable that City, we're going." people saying it's inevitable City are going to win the league. They're going to come up behind everyone. Well, why do we think that? Because we've seen it unfold time and time again. Credit, to, I'll finish off by saying credit to Unai Emery. Um, Who we will touch on. On the day, he got it absolutely right. He's done a really good job at Villa. I've said on this show before, he should be manager of the season. Um, and, and fair play to him. He got it right and, and Villa got all three points and they deserved them. And also the one big moment that we do have to mention as well is, is Trossard's chance of Emi Martinez. I mean, people say that's a great save. I think that's a bad miss. Agreed. Rather than, rather than a great save. But yeah, okay, it is in the grand scheme of things, but Trossard has to be finishing. And that was at nil nil as well, which could have been a real turning point in the game. But a couple of super chats again. One from Ram. Good to see you, mate. I know he's a, a long-time subscriber of 90 Min. Need an apology, Harry. Respect for Unai Emery. Um, to be fair, Harry has been very magnanimous in that respect. I mean, and we, we literally sat here and recorded a video on Friday praising Unai Emery. So th this, th th this is... Give it the, a watch is basically yeah, what we're saying. Yeah, give it a watch. Yeah. Yeah. We made Harry sit in that seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Natchiket, Chelsea beat Manchester City, Madrid to win Champions League. Come on. Okay, we'll cross over to the... Uh, other team who, who dropped points in the title race uh, Scott Liverpool nil Crystal Palace won um, Klopp has called for a reaction after the Palace defeat that's now five points dropped from Liverpool in the last two uh, Premier League games obviously the Atalanta 3-0 defeat sandwich in between <laughs> it's not the end of the title race because there is still six games to go but did it feel like yesterday it was the end not yes, I think so. But you you see this in football in certain seasons quite often. Like there can be a week or the space of ten days where everything either goes right for you or everything like the somebody just pops a balloon and everything just falls out. Um, Liverpool should have beat United last week. They had so many chances. Whatever happened on Thursday is whatever happened on Thursday. And yesterday again against Palace, they had so many chances to score. Palace themselves deserve a lot of credit. I'm sure we'll get on to that. But Liverpool's big problem recently has been the fact that they're not taking chances. When Grizz was here the other day, he said, I'm sure if Diogo Jota's back, we take some of the chances that we're missing. And he was back yesterday, they didn't take any. And he missed one himself. Uh, it just seems like, you know, Liverpool are... 
I always, I always felt like the fact that they concede first in so many games, I thought it would catch up with them at some point. I thought it would be a problem because that means you're always having to chase the game. You're always having to put the pressure on. You're leaving yourself exposed towards the back. And it's, it's difficult to kind of keep going to the well and coming back from that. Arsenal, I've always felt this season, have been a better team than Liverpool because they have more control. Liverpool have been more, it's Klopp's final season, kind of more vibes, you know? They have a lot of shots, a lot of chances, and Grizz has been quick to give credit to how good Liverpool are and their results, but I've always felt like they haven't had as much control as the other two teams in the title race. That's why I've always put them third in my uh, favourite teams to win the league. But yeah, um, nobody expected the Atalanta defeat. And that was terrible. It was really, really bad. You're expecting them to go and win the Europa League. The narrative of a romantic end to Klopp's reign at Liverpool. He's got two matches left, potentially two matches left at Anfield. Jurgen Klopp, if they don't get wow. through in the in the Europa League. So, you know, Palace do deserve a lot of credit, but I think Liverpool are, and Arsenal in this sense, especially if this week goes bad in Europe, that could be, this this period could be the end of the season where everything kind of goes to pop. For them. Ollie, we mentioned about how with Arsenal, whether you can quantify a good season with, with trophies, etc. With Liverpool, it's, it's a fascinating one because when they won the Carabao Cup, everyone was going, God, Klopp quadruple in their final season mm. I know Scott says it's got an asterisk next to it because it's not the Champions League but the a point is yeah. I agree with that it would have be been their yeah. a quadruple mm. if Liverpool finished this season with just the Carabao Cup and finished third and finished third in the league mm. Eric Ten Hag well, I think the only thing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Eric Ten Hag's the winner <laughs> Scott, maybe maybe you should take over that vacancy. I don't know. Um, yeah, um, I still think it would be a massive improvement on last season as well, where they finished fifth. I don't really think, if we're being completely honest, people expected them at this point to still be in a title race. Um, you know, obviously they've done it before, but I'm not quite sure that because of the way they they were last season, because they were revamping their whole midfield as well. I think it's it's pretty impressive that they're in this conversation anyway, and they are still in it as well. But I do agree with Scott, and you know he said that their big issue is is not finishing chances, and of course it is. But actually, I think it's the fact that they've they think they've gone behind in eighteen games this season, and at some point that wasn't going to be sustainable. And they just found out that you know Crystal Palace put in an unbelievable defensive display, and because of that, not finishing chances have caught up with them as well. You know that's where they've been been found out. But is it a poor season for Liverpool? Well, they've they've got a trophy in in the cabinet. We've seen them do it before in Europe. I don't think that ties over. I really don't think we that ties over fair, against Atalanta. To one for yeah, yeah. Let's get to the Europa League. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Bear um, or, uh, it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hey, and, and, and it's going well at the moment. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a hot streak. Keep going. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So um, I don't think they're done. Um, this season, I still think they've got a lot to fight for, and also third in a, in a league cup. Given what where they were at the start of this season, I still don't think is is that poor. And we've said it before, but they're coming up against Man City, who might take a clean sweep of all those trophies as well. They're, they're a mammoth, and it, it's so difficult to, to beat them to them. Harry, as a as a fellow title rival, Oli Oli mentioned sort of what they're lacking. What do you think Liverpool are lacking at this moment? And it's really difficult, right? So we're sat here, we're critiquing three of you know in terms of the title races. This is Really up there is one of the best title races I think we've seen in terms of the quality of the top three teams in this in this league. But when it's got to the crunch point of the season, and there's still six games to go, we do have to mention that, but just because of the way City can hit that groove in the last few games of the season, what have Liverpool lacked maybe at this point compared to seasons gone by, even when they won the league in 1920? What's the difference with this Liverpool team and what we've seen before? It's really difficult to put your finger on it because... There was a point earlier on in the title race, or you could argue before the title race really got going, that Liverpool were decimated by injuries and they were picking up results. And I was looking at them and I was thinking, if you're picking up results with all these players missing, what are you going to be like when everybody comes back to fitness? And it feels like they've started to get players back mm. to fitness and, and, and all the rest of it. And it's just not happened. It is, it's it's the typical stuff that you see online, that revisionism, right? When Jurgen Klopp announced that he was leaving, I remember many Liverpool fans saying, this is great that we've heard this now. Not, It's not, not great that he's leaving, but it's great that that's there now because it's galvanised us mm. and we're going to be desperate to put it right and, and do everything um, to the best of our ability and go on and win trophies for Jurgen Klopp's farewell. And yesterday, I heard many Liverpool fans saying, well, I can't believe he's announced that before the end of the season because it's unsettled everyone and it's derailed us. 
Hold on a minute. Which one is it? Which always, one is it? It's like, always been the, uh, oh, well, we're out of the FA Cup now, so we can concentrate on yeah. <laughs> on Europe but, and, the, but even away, and the Premier League. Even, and now even, it's, you know, oh, let's concentrate on the league. We've just lost 3-0 in Europe and now you're losing at home in the Premier League. I think, I, think <laughs> Mo, I think Mo Salah's been really poor recently. Yeah. Really poor. And I don't know where that's come from. Mm. And I think... Mo Salah normally would be the difference maker in those games where mm. it's decided by the finest of margins and he's just not doing that at a minute. Uh, Bargen in the in the comment section says, Jakey, Liverpool aren't clinical uh, in front of goal. They're the most shots on target. Yeah, they're so so poor in terms of being clinical. MK says, a stable back five. No Alisson, R- Robertson, Trent for a month. Canate in and out, etc. Mm. That's a really, really good point as well. But... Um, I guess the yeah the fact of the matter is they're giving up too many chances and they're not being great um, in front of goal. I guess we do have to give Palace there a lot of Definitely. credit as well. And the one player that I really stood out for me yesterday, there was some big performances. Joachim Anderson at the back, obviously yep. got man of the match. But Adam Walton in midfield, 20 years old, they signed him for £18 million from Blackburn. He's in the under-21 20, under England squad at the moment. He just looks like a proper... Technical midfield. I know, Ollie, I know you're you're a fan of him as well, but he yeah. just looks he looks the real deal. And someone who I feel like the great thing about Palace is you can kind of go under the radar a little bit. So if you have maybe a little bit of a low key performance, you can just develop, and it's almost the right club to be at. What did you make of his his display uh, he, yesterday? He was brilliant, and I've been lucky enough to see a lot of um, Palace, especially since Glasner took over and since Wharton came in. And what he's added to their midfield is is ridiculous. You know, there's so much energy, there's so much tenacity. He's doing all of that unseen work as well. Such a kind of, he's added so much bite to their midfield. I thought earlier on in the season they were missing. Everyone always looks at Palace as such a, you know, a strong defensive kind of unit, and actually they weren't for for a lot of those games, especially under Hodgson. And I think Wharton has has brought that back in, in terms of the midfield as well. Um, but yeah, I think you're right to point out um, Anderson. He was superb, and then Ezra with the oh, winner as well. And, and that was you know, well crafted goal as well. I think yeah, it's so kind of good. Under the radar yeah, a little bit. So good. And um, I think. If you're a Palace fan as well, Eze, he's got to become your new uh, Wilf Zaha in, in the sense that they've got to try and keep hold of him somehow. I don't think they will because he's such a talent, but um, he, he is just on fire at the moment and uh, and a really good player. And I, I feel sorry for Eze because he got that injury and I think had he stayed fit, he would have had a, a huge shout to, to go with England yeah, as well. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Uh, Pac-Man sorry, just said, first time anyone's ever said, I've been lucky enough to see a lot of <laughs> 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 We've had so a couple lucky. of super chats as well. If we go back up to Sean, uh, there we go. Sean, thanks so much, mate, for for another super chat. Does this prove that Jurgen Klopp's achievements are more impressive than people say? He went toe to toe with the better City side for years and missed out by a point. No, because no. by the logic so, of the no, people so it's, it's in the, the same chat. conversation we're yeah, having. Exactly. Same conversation. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> by the logic of Scott is loving this. By, by the logic of loads of people in the chat, Jurgen Klopp bottled it every single one of those seasons that he didn't win the league. That that that's what. No, not really. It depends when the loss comes. Well, like if you're in a position where you have a lead over City and you lose it in a game you're expected to win, eh, technically, maybe. Paper Cups podcast. Arsenal moved past uh, Zinchenko and Agreed. Jesus. Uh, Ryan C. Uh, just on Villa Arsenal. Going back to the to the show at the start. Villa wanted it more than Arsenal. Don Emery got it tactically perfect. Arsenal expects us to roll over in the second half. McGinn and Tielemans boss Rice, and we will. I've said it a couple of times, we will give Villa a section on the Champions League race in just a second. Harry, I know you want Rogers to Rogers was that. really good as well for Villa. He doesn't he didn't get a mention. I thought he was really good. Rogers, yeah, Morgan yeah. Rogers. He was on loan at Middlesbrough this season. Mm. He's come back and been really good. In good. terms of the title picture, um, Scott, City go two points clear, obviously beating Luton five one. Um Two points ahead, six games left. City's running, we've mentioned quite a few times in the show, is 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 the easiest. I think the only obvious slip up is probably Spurs away. Mm. Out of the out of the team, right, but right, you never that. know what you're getting out of Brighton away. Obviously, they've got an FA Cup semi final, which you know you don't know what you're getting out of Chelsea at the moment. Chelsea have uh, drawn with City twice this season. Am yeah. I right in the league? So you know you you're not saying that that one's a foregone conclusion. So potentially City could walk in to a similar situation this week that Arsenal and Liverpool have just walked into. Maybe, but you'd expect uh, City to progress out of that, and then Brighton away is one of those where. I think we usually see City go to Brighton and think, ooh, they could slip up there and then they just end up. Final dead season yeah. a few years back. Yeah. They won like 4-0, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. Four yeah. Like um, Ollie, City are 12 games away from the unheard of double treble. And my question to you is, where would that rank in terms of football achievements, in your opinion? It's With Pep Guardiola, with the City team. In Premier League history, is it is it right up there as one of the... 
Oh, it has to be. It absolutely has to be. It has to be one of it has to be one of the greatest achievements in club football. Surely they're in one of the most competitive leagues, and that's been proven by the fact that it's a three horse title race. Uh, the FA Cup. Let's not forget they've had some tough games, including their first one in the competition with Spurs away, where they famously had never won as well at that stadium. Uh, managed to beat them there, which is why I don't think they'll struggle in that game yeah. in the league this season as well. Um, and then winning the Champions League twice, you know, in a row, that's that's hardly ever happened as well. So I think it's it's a staggering achievement. <laughs> I mean, Harry uh, obviously pointed out the little asterisk as well um, that might be alongside it. And listen, they have an incredible amount of resources, um, but to still pull that off is unbelievable. I, uh, seriously, I, uh, as I said, I think that's one of the greatest achievements in, in club football. What a massive week it is for them though as well. They've got to go, um, well, they've got to take on Real Madrid uh, and then uh, they've got Chelsea in that in that cup. And I think this week's going to be where it is obviously one one and lost. If they can win those two games, I can see them going on and, and winning it all again. Harry, is it psychologically now from an Arsenal perspective and we think of Liverpool and, and, we, and we mention about how Klopp's asking for a reaction now after the last week. I'm sure Arteta will be asking the same going into this spine second leg. Is that almost, is it psychologically and mentally at this point in the season, probably the result of Bayern people didn't expect to an extent. I think people thought Arsenal would go to the Allianz with the lead. We mentioned the Villa defeat, Palace defeat for Liverpool, Atalanta defeat for Liverpool. Is it more psychologically, do you think, now that's so tough in this title race to get pick yourself back up? Because we have seen City do it time after time after time at this point in the season. When you look at the standards that City have set over the years in terms of the amount of games that you can get away with losing, minimal, um, you know, the amount of points that you can afford to drop, minimal, then you have to bounce back very quickly each and every time you face a setback. And... I've always thought that the Champions League is going to have a big part on the title race because you can either get re-energised from a really positive result or it can drain you even further at a really crucial stage in the season. So I think it's imperative that Arsenal um, bounce back. I think for Liverpool, I don't think there's any expectation on them to get back in their Europa League tie. So I think if that kind of goes the way we think it's going to go and Atalanta are going to go through, then I don't think that has much impact. I think the damage for Liverpool in terms of European result and knock-on effect on the Premier League. We've already seen that this weekend with Palace. So, yeah, I think the, the psychological element is massive here. And as I said earlier on, the fact that it's City that have climbed back to the top rather than Liverpool, although I look at it and it's two points and it's definitely not over with six games to go. And if you ask me in December, would I go into the last six games, two points off of City and be happy with it? I'd have taken it. It's just the fact that it's them and you look at them and you think... You're going to have to win all of your games and you might not even win the league. Mm. And then, it, it just, I, I said it the other week, right, when we, we talked about it. If Arsenal were to win their last six games, they'd have won, what, well, they've won 10, they'd have won 16, drawn one, lost one in the second part of the season. That's an unbelievable result. But they still, still bottled it, Harry. The and they still <laughs> bottled it, yeah. Do you know, though, right, because City are in the semi final in the FA Cup, they don't play in the league again until the 25th. Arsenal played twice, and so do Liverpool. Mm. Before that point, I think I think Liverpool do. Mm. They definitely play once at least. Mm. Yeah, Liverpool play twice as well. So what can happen is I know City will have games in hand, but Arsenal and Liverpool have to do their jobs and win their matches. Although you have Wolves away, is it next? Yep. And then you got Chelsea at home. Yep. So difficult matches. But if Arsenal and Liverpool go and take six points from their next two games, the pressure is back on City because then they have to catch up. Mm. And then the picture could be when we're speaking on the morning of Thursday, April the 25th, that these two teams are now, what, four points ahead of Man City? And City has some catching up to do with two games in hand. Ollie, we Scott went uh, City, Harry went City. I actually went Arsenal at the start of the season. Your prediction at the start of the season, your prediction now? Uh, it was Man City. And um, now? And now it is Man City. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Something's never changed. I just, it's, it's like you just said, though. I just, you know, it's when they get to that, that run in and, and when they get to that. You know what? It's so funny because for so much of the start of the season, people were saying, um, oh, but City always go on a run. They always go on a run. And I was getting a bit bored of it. I was a bit like, well, you, all right, they're, they're very, very good. But they've also, you know, they'd lost to Wolves. They, they didn't quite look like the same Manchester City team that we'd seen last season. But yeah, they've proved me wrong and right because I, I ju you just knew they were going to kick on and I, I just can't see them 
losing or dropping points in any of those last games. I don't think the running is is hard enough. And I see them beating Tottenham away as well and, and getting getting the job done. We've got a poll in the live chat. Shout out to producer Ben. Who would, What would be the most impressive achievement? Manchester City's double treble, Real Madrid's three Champions Leagues, or Barca's 2009 sex tuple? Tuple. Sex tuple. <laughs> <laughs> sex tuple. Sounded a bit dodgy. Um, <laughs> halfway through the show, make sure to leave a like on the stream, subscribe to Nighty Me, and share this video with as many people as possible. Follow Ollie, myself, Harry, and Scott on our social channels. Scott, you wanted to jump There's in? There's another super chat. Go and read it from out for me. Sean. Jurgen Klopp, Sean. Jurgen Klopp came second when he had lost one game, which was to City, finished on 97 points. That's not the same as losing during the running. running. That's not bottling, Harry. But I'd never said it was bottling. I'm saying that none of them are bottling. Mm. It's the people in the chat that are saying this team bottled it, that and team bottled it. it's on our thumbnail. <laughs> I've, I've not, I've never, I never at any point. To be fair, none of us have said Arsenal bottled it. No, but you're insinuating it. And well, also, we've got to ask, we've got to ask and, the question for the viewers. The viewers will be thinking And the that. viewers are saying it. Okay. I, my argument is I never called Liverpool bottle jobs when they finished one point off of Man City. The other thing as well that really winds me up that I've heard this year constantly it's driven me up the walls. Man City are not as good as they were last year. You know Man City are on course to win more points this season than they did last year. If they win all their remaining games, which everyone is saying they will, that's why in a lot of people's eyes they're already just, the just champions. <laughs> then <laughs> if, if, <laughs> And I've been lucky enough to see Crystal Palace at home a lot. There you go. You know. <laughs> if Manchester City win all of their Premier League games the last six they achieve more points than they did last season but all I've heard for the last few months is oh this is Arsenal's opportunity because Man City be fair, are not say, as good as they were to be fair I was talking about that stretch right at the start of the season where they I think they lost two games in a row didn't they um, yeah I'm, I'm not even having yeah not, no no but, I'm, um, I'm talking about the general narrative oh you have to win the league this year because City are no good this year mm. no but they're going to achieve more points yeah, than they did last it's crazy. year crazy it's crazy. crazy. I mean, just 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 to wrap up on this one, I don't think we've any of us have said Arsenal have bottled it, but I think what we've seen it is similar trends to what we've seen over the course of this season. Which, as I said at the top of the show, West Ham at home, Bayern at home, Aston Villa at home, team sitting deep, playing on the counter attack. Arsenal struggle with that, Harry. That is that is that is you've, genuinely you've picked a three fact. games, one of which we didn't even lose. Yeah, and. But two of them happened. You're trying in the to create same. a narrative out of it. Like, I, I, I don't understand. Well, no, no, no. no, no, no I'm, understand. I'm, I'm providing the results. I'm providing the performance that those teams against you put in, right? And I think it's a fair argument to say that Arsenal struggle against that tactic, and that's why Unai Emery, no, someone who adapts his whole against, team to the opposition, has set up. They, at the they Emirates also play beat like West Ham six 0 um, Arsenal who, who always and, and that, that game tactic. at the Emirates. Arsenal battered West Ham. The ball just wouldn't go in. It was never a case of. West Ham came there, they limited Arsenal, Arsenal created no chances and the game fizzled out. It wasn't that. If you watch the game, it wasn't that. Jakey, I've said consistently on the channel, when we talk about greatest title races of all time, I said the title race doesn't start really until after 30 matches. Because that, is, especially if you're mm. like as close as these three teams are, that's when it starts properly. Because you've got to keep pace with the other teams and stay ahead of them in Arsenal's case. Now, there could be other turns and other twists, but I just think... As I said the other day, the fact that City have been here and done it before, you'd expect them to be more capable of dealing with the matches that they've got left and dealing with the pressure that's going to be put on them. Arsenal-Liverpool. Liverpool did it once with no fans. Uh, the rest of the time, they haven't been able to get over the line. And Arsenal couldn't do it last season. And they, as it stands, are looking like they're not going to do it this season either. But it's, for me, you've got to be able to deal with the weeks where the games come thick and fast and they're against good clubs, big teams in big competitions across different competitions. And the fact that Arsenal haven't won either of the last two games, you can, know, that can, they can swing it back in their favour if they go, go to Munich and win. Yeah. But would you, sorry, can, can, I, can I ask Harry one question? You had a penalty shootout against Porto and won it. If you'd lost it, do you think the result against Villa is different? And that you're still in the title race properly. You still are in it, two points, but you know what I mean. Possibly, because I do think that Champions League is taking its toll on us. Um, and I think a lot of the players that played yesterday looked shot of fitness, basically. Um, it's not an, People keep saying it's an excuse. This is what I've had on social media over the last 24 hours. It's an excuse. Stop using it as an excuse. Villa played on Thursday. I'm not using it as an excuse. It's an observation with regards to whether Arsenal were fit enough on the day, and they weren't. If we didn't progress in the Champions League, maybe, you know, obviously not having that game in midweek helps us, but then I would argue 
that there might have been a hangover from going out of the Champions League in the game that followed Porto. So, mm. like, it could have had a psychological impact earlier on. So, mm. I, I, I get what you're saying, but I think it's really hard to... We mentioned we mentioned Arsenal Villa. We need, do need to, we're going to do a section on Aston Villa now. I think. And I'm, whoa! As soon as Unai Emery is brought up in conversation, <laughs> thunders and lightning's going off. Um, let's touch on Unai Emery, uh, Ollie, because one of the things I just said to Harry there, the, the the real big skill I think he has over some other managers is the is his willingness to tailor his team according to the opponent he's facing. And I think that's what he did yesterday. I know I mentioned at times they sat deep, but at times they had the high line. Carlos at the back that allowed them to play yeah. really high because he's so quick going the mm, other way mm, mm. and I think what you saw with Unai Emery is the way he adapts to the to the game situation in terms of underrated managers where does he where does he rank do you think he's underrated in terms of the job he's done this season at Aston Villa I don't think he's been underrated this season I think he's actually had a lot of praise I mean you know both of you guys have said that he should get manager this season and I'd, I'd agree with you as well um, probably unless Pep goes on to win the treble surely you've got a hand it to him uh, then but um, he's been absolutely fantastic and you've nailed it there it's the adaptability in the games isn't it it's the way that he can almost organise a game in some senses there are a few times this season that he has been found out notably Newcastle. against Newcastle away and against Newcastle at home as well uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, long live anyhow um, but, uh, oh, but but he he has seriously <laughs> impressed me as well and I think Harry, I think, mentioned it earlier. Everyone kind of looked at Emery in the way that it had gone at Arsenal and the fact that he was carrying on from um, uh, from Arsene Wenger. And that's when I thought that he was he's potentially underrated because then what he went on to achieve, winning the Europa Leagues, I think he's won four. Um, and then Aston Villa actually managing to get him after that disaster with Steven Gerrard and where Aston Villa actually were to to have got them to this level. And let's, let's be honest, they're... They should now kick on to get into to fourth place. Having having a European campaign, albeit in the Conference League, but alongside, I think that's unbelievably impressive. And, and I agree with these two that he should be manager of the year. Yeah, spot on. At least if Bayern beat Arsenal and you know the coefficient impacted and us <laughs> losing to Villa yesterday, if, if it means that fifth place doesn't get Champions League <laughs> and Villa finished fourth, then at least there's some consolation. There. <laughs> well, this, you know, this, is a, this is a really interesting point because... The UEFA coefficient points looks like fifth in the Premier League won't get Champions League, and for a long period of the season, it did look like fifth was going to get it. Scott, I think Germany are they? The German, English Germany teams bottled it. That's why. The, well, <laughs> no, literally, literally. That's why. Because <laughs> well, Bayern. I think uh, people expected Arsenal to beat Bayern. Yeah, I I didn't, but people did. Uh, West Ham versus Bayer Leverkusen. That's a German team versus a, an English team directly. And people expected Liverpool to win the Europa League because they're by far and away, maybe apart from Bayer Leverkusen, the strongest team in that competition. So, yeah, uh, what are you smoking? We, we're getting loads of stick in the comments today. I mean, I've just been told that I'm waffling about trends in football. KP Masters is saying Arsenal fans blaming their defeat on Liverpool losing is hilarious. I don't think, don't think we did that. K KP Masters, um, I think you need to uh, to go back and rewatch the beginning of the stream because I don't. Does anyone recall? me saying that Arsenal lost because Liverpool lost. No. Wow. Incredible. Um, in fact, I think I, I, think I actually that. asked did, you that and you went, absolutely not. Did, <laughs> so, yeah. did you say, I think if Liverpool's result, had, if Liverpool had won, that might have changed the result? No, I said that Liverpool's result didn't change what we needed to do. Right. I said that for me, everyone was jumping up and down in the Emirates when mm. Liverpool lost and for me, it never changed what we had to do yeah. because Man City had already put three points mm. on the board. And that's the bit that we always forget because people think that you see your game in isolation but you all know those Arsenal players yeah, and you going course. into the result of the Liverpool mm. Liverpool match. Um, John McGinn's performance yesterday, top, top, top performance. But I guess the, the main thing to ask Harry, um, Harry Scott, Ollie, have Villa become the favourites for fourth place? They're, yes. Spurs have a game in hand. If they win their game, Villa is still ahead on goal difference. I think by two or three goals. Are oh, Aston Villa now the favourites for the Champions League? I, I'm sure we'll talk about Tottenham very shortly, and I'm sure you can't wait to talk about Tottenham. <laughs> Tottenham, I, I, I identified this this phase of the season a, a few weeks ago, and I said when people were talking about Tottenham being like the, the favourites for it, and at that time it looked like fifth was going to be getting Champions League. Newcastle, Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, and Man City in the space of six games for Tottenham. Now that's the first game of that lot. They've lost 4-0 at Newcastle. Mm. Arsenal might be damaged by the end of the month, but may maybe Arsenal come out of that and go to the go to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and 
just be reborn and back into it. Chelsea away and then, and then Liverpool away. And they hate playing Chelsea. They've yeah, got they awful do. record against they Chelsea. Uh, so to me, I look at that list and I, I, I would say, I cannot, I'll put it nicely, I cannot see Spurs winning six out of six. So Aston Villa have still got to play Liverpool at home and City as well. Wait a minute. By today's logic, haven't Spurs bottled fourth spot? We are going to talk. Potentially, Harry, we're, 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 we're not there yet. Just asking the question. We are going to talk. Oh, they've got to play Chelsea. Aston Villa have got to play Chelsea. Um, let's, let's touch on uh, the Newcastle Spurs game because we, we, we say going into this one, Spurs have an absolutely abysmal record at St. James's Park. I think you look over the last couple of seasons, last day of the seasons, opening day of the seasons, any yeah. game of the season, they just haven't got a great record there. Um, Oli, as a Newcastle fan, what was so good about that Newcastle performance at the weekend from other performances you've seen this season? Oh, just so much. So much. You said we could just touch on it. Let's just do it for the rest of the show. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I was just... Do you know what impressed me the most about it is for a lot of this season, there's been a few games, I think especially that we had a really difficult Christmas period where I thought Eddie Howe just needs to be a bit more adaptable here because our kind of high energy style, high press and, and trying to outrun and outwork teams wasn't quite working just because of you know, having the most injuries and, and the most uh, time spent out per player. So many key players not in the squad as well. You know, players like Joel Linton, players like Nick Pope's been a massive miss for us um, as well. But that felt like we were massively back to our best. But what's interesting is actually when you look at the fact we only had, I think, 27% possession in the game. Hardly had the ball, but was so direct and so clinical. And that's easy when you've got a player like Alexander Isak. Um, but that front three was absolutely frightening as well. Harvey Barnes had a terrific game again. Anthony Gordon. And what I'm finding so impressive about this team at the moment is the fact that a lot of these players are, are pretty much just back from really lengthy injuries and they're still putting in incredible performances. Elliot Anderson, who actually I thought was man of the match, despite the fact that we won 4-0, he was incredible. Played as a, a, a number eight, but also was having to fill in in a, in a kind of left back role as well, uh, yeah, that I think was probably our best performance of of the whole season. Can I ask? Can I ask you a question? In the, today's elitism of football styles and mm. dominating possession, I'm probably going to answer the same as you if you ask me the same question. Does it bother you that you had twenty twenty seven percent possession and one four nil? No, because even though that was the case, it felt like we were in complete control yeah. of the whole game. And, and Spurs early on threatened, but they had Timo Werner, so that was never <laughs> going to be a problem. Um, it's like and, trying to draw with a blunt pencil. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but, but what's interesting is... Blunt I think, ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's interesting is that they had, they had such little possession, but also I think they had their third highest ever amount of touches in an opposition box under... Uh, during their time anyhow that is such a weird little stat by the it's way like, yeah yeah it's like, yeah 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 after all yeah cheers yeah follow me um yeah <laughs> but uh that just proves that, that it was just it, it was it was newcastle just that they're absolutely you know so much energy so much fight in that team and you know to be honest it, it i've got to say I, I look i was thinking about it yesterday and i genuinely think, i don't know what you guys think about this but i genuinely think that eddie howe has had a better season than Andrew Postacoglu as a manager. I genuinely think he has. Because I know that Spurs are fifth. I know that they're 10 points above us and, and that he has improved them. And, and I know that there'll be some Tottenham fans definitely coming at me for this. But I just want to make my point about this. Tottenham were not in any European competition this season. They went out in the first round of both cups. Fulham away was one of them. And then they played Man City in the FA Cup and lost that. And you might look at that and go, well... No, they, they, they took on Man City. They're, they're so difficult to beat. Newcastle beat Man City in the League Cup. They then had ridiculous draws. Man United away, Chelsea away as well. Um, they had horrendous draws in the FA Cup as well. They, they took on Sunderland. They got to the quarterfinals of both those competitions. They had the hardest group in the Champions League and because of a dodgy penalty decision, you know, actually should have at least finished third in that group for me. Um, away in Paris, the Livramento handball. And they are now sixth in the table. And you just mentioned Tottenham's fixtures. And if you've looked at Newcastle's fixtures, they're a lot more favourable. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a 10-point gap, but that could diminish to a point where when we get to the last day of the season, they could push, um, be pushing for that fifth place. I know in the table at the moment, it doesn't look like it, but 
I think the other thing, the reason why I pick out the managers there, though, is that, like I said, Eddie Howe has managed to show adaptability. We spoke about Unai Emery being so brilliant with that um, earlier on, and he's shown that he can do that. We've won our last, um, not won our last four games, but won three of them with him doing that. When you look at Ange Postacoglu, it's that stubbornness. They have a plan A that when it works is fantastic, free-flowing football. But after plan A is plan A. They don't have any other way of doing it. And when I was watching that Newcastle game, I, just, I have to say, I just thought an eight-year-old could work out to, to beat this team. It's the same problem. It's that ridiculous high line. Look at the third goal. It's literally one ball. Bruno Gimaraes over the top. Alexander Isak sticks it in the back of the net. And that would frustrate me so much as a Tottenham fan. It would frustrate me a lot more than my own team having not much possession because it just seems so easy to work out. And I just find his stubbornness about that so crazy and unsustainable. I think that's a great point. Who has had a better season? Eddie Howe or Ange Postacoglu? I think you'd have to wait to see how these fixtures pan out. I'm just going to call them out. Uh, yes. Can I just say that's yeah. right now. Yeah. Right now. Right we'll here, see right, how it now. Goes. Now. right, here, right now. Who has had a better season? Eddie Howe or Ange Postacoglu? This is before the last six games of the season, Scott. I'm not going to, I'm not going to agree currently, but if Newcastle close the gap, you've got Palace away, Sheffield United, Burnley, Brighton, Man United and Brentford left. Whereas, Tottenham have got some really difficult games and you could potentially see them not winning four of those. Um, but yeah, to me, I think I think you can close the gap. I really do. Because mm. I think New what Newcastle have struggled with is that energy because of the injuries. Now you're playing one game a week or whatever mm. it is. I would point out, well, to be fair, Spurs have had their own injuries. I understand yeah. they had that every game against Chelsea. Every team has. Yeah. Every team has and, and I get that, that Andrews had to deal with that as well. But I, I just feel that a lot... When you when you when you've got a European campaign alongside, yeah, I still feel that because Newcastle have had to try and push on in, in those competitions as well, that for me adds another level to how well Eddie Howe's done, and and I I do think that he potentially deserves a bit more praise than he has got this season. There were there were times when they were three one down at West Ham. I had people texting me and say, you know essentially saying he's sacked. Like who do you want next? Mm. And they went on to win that game four three, and then have pushed on since there as well. So yeah, I I think. Let's see how the rest of the season goes. But I, I think you'd be a bit worried if you're a Tottenham fan because I think Newcastle are coming up behind pretty sharpish. And also, they've got some really tough games to come as well. Yeah. We've had a super chat from, from Ryan C. Uh, fair play, Harry and Gents, for the Villa Emery praise. Hopefully, we have top four now. If Arsenal had Watkins, they win the Prem. They need a goal scorer. And that's one player that Uno Emery has completely taken to another level, I think, with Ollie Watkins. He's, on, he's pretty much guaranteed to be on the planes of the Euros, I think. He gets in the squad easily. Mm -hmm. 19 goals this season. A lovely finish as well. Uh, we, had a, we had another super chat as well. We did me. have another super chat. I think it was in reference to what I said about. I've got it here. If you go want. on, yeah, go on, mate. Uh, from Givan, is it? Yeah. Unfair to say Villa played on the counter attack. Second half, they built up from the goalkeeper through the Arsenal press and exposed habits in midfield. Yeah, I, I, what I meant by that was at, what, with Emery's style, at times they are allowed to sit deep and at times they can play high. My point is, Arsenal struggle when teams sit back to break down a team that's all I'm going to say on that um, everybody's sat back against Arsenal this year with the exception of Man City and maybe Liverpool uh, Wolfgang said Jakey Emery or Arteta who has had a better season uh, Emery for now. E Emery with regards to the expectations yeah. around him mm. uh, yeah I think that's an easy one yeah if you give it context it's Emery yeah, yeah. Sweet. You need um, context. should we touch on Spurs uh, quickly as well Scott because I think Oli hit the nail on the head there in terms of when I watch Spurs now, I just feel they're really predictable. And I asked myself the question yesterday. I was like, when was the last time... Did you verbalise it? Did you verbalise that question? I didn't say... I was at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium yesterday. <laughs> I wasn't speaking to the Tottenham staff going, yeah, you, you know what? You guys are really predictable to watch. Um, but Can I, I just say, it's the first time I've seen Harry smile this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> talking about Spurs losing Talking about Spurs being oh, bad. I love Harry. The, the, the one thing you say about Spurs is, and I asked myself this question yesterday, when was the last time Spurs scored from outside the box? And, and I also ask myself the question, you do see very similar goals with Spurs. It's that typical wide players getting to the byline, cutting it back. There's patterns of play, there's a structure to the way they want to play. But it can be very predictable, Scott. And Ange stated in his post-match after the Newcastle game that Spurs had a lack of bravery on the ball. I think one player that probably did that a little bit was James Madison, if we're, if we're being honest. He's someone who Spurs have to play through and he mm. wasn't at his best at the weekend. He hasn't been for, for a bit of time. He hasn't been. As well. And I think my only problem with Spurs, Scott, well, <laughs> just this season with this team, is I think if they play badly, they can't it's win. Very bad. 
if, if you know what I mean. You know those mm. teams where they can grind out results. I think Emery's at Aston Villa can grind out a result even if they don't play particularly well. I don't think Spurs can do that. Number one, because they can't keep a clean sheet at the, at the moment. But also, it can be predictable going forward. Is that harsh from my perspective? I don't think it's harsh. I think Spurs fans might tell you it's harsh because the... Tottenham fans have looked at Ange Ball this season and have gone, yes, we finally have a style of football that we can get behind after years of Mourinho and Conte mm. stinking out the place. To me, you need to be more adaptable than having one style. And I don't know, and obviously Spurs will need to improve their squad, but I don't know if there is another plan beneath this. So when it's good, it works. But like you say, I think they're quite predictable in the way that they score goals. But the more you go on, the more teams will figure it out in the Premier League. And I feel like if you catch on early in a game, like Newcastle did the other day, you can continually expose it. So Andrew's going to have to change some things or come up with something else to, you know, get around the problem when Dude, teams yeah, figure his team he out. Not, he's kind of made his bed, hasn't he? He has. He, because and, he's so... In, yeah. When he talks about it in the press, he is so stubborn about it. He's, yeah. you know, the, the age-old quote is, you know, that's, that's the way we play, mate. He's not, he's not going to budge on it. And... I don't know. You'd kind of sit there as an oppos opposition manager in this league and think, right? If we can, if we can deal with Tottenham going forward here, there there is a way to beat them that we've seen other teams do. Yeah. And you know Tottenham aren't going to change. And actually, as well, this is what we saw earlier in the season. If Mickey Van der Ven doesn't doesn't play, it, it's an absolute nightmare. Because or of spends his pace. half the game on the ground. Like <laughs> the well, if, if he doesn't play Oli, but also it does make the point it, when he doesn't have the best game. Exactly, like, like he didn't. Yeah. I felt, to be honest, I felt a little bit bad for him to be uh, if I'm being really really honest because yes his positioning is not great the slip's unfortunate but I think the bigger bigger issue for Spurs is where's the protection in front of him mm. I mean Romero and Van der Ven Basuma's halfway up the pitch for that mm. uh, Isaac goal um, he's dropped off a cliff for my mm. hey, Van der Ven Basuma 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 yeah potentially but we do have to if we take a step back Spurs on the whole have had a good season but we wanted mm. to touch on Newcastle, and I know Harry wants to talk about Alexander Isak, whose finishing is so yeah, good. Of course in this he division. does, because he wants him. Harry, what <laughs> football player does Alexander Isak remind you of? He reminds me of, and he's not there yet, but he reminds me of Thierry Henry mm. in the way that he takes the ball in his stride and he doesn't need that long to kind of get his body in that position where he can open up his foot and steer it into the far corner. Um, Thierry Henry used to have this incredible ability to bring the ball under control, be running at 100 miles an hour and then be able to just very quickly swivel his body, open up his boot and find the bottom corner. And you couldn't predict when he was going to do it because he didn't sort of position himself around the ball. He sort of just moved into that position really quickly. And Alexander Isak has got that, man. It's just the fitness thing. Mm -hmm. You know, outside of that, he's an unbelievable player. And I loved, I can't remember which goal it was, as in which order it was. But the one, I think it might have been, his, it was definitely his first goal. The second goal was great because he takes a lovely little touch to kind of set himself before he finishes it. The first one, he looks like he's going to go across the goal and he just sort of arches his foot, curves his foot at the last minute and goes at the near post and beats mm. Vicario. He's just unreal. Oli, you're probably best talking about How good is he, Zach? Where do you rank him in terms of strikers in this division? Um, very highly. Very, very highly. I think that he's a player that... Uh, and I, I obviously don't want this to happen, but if we're, Arsenal were to sign him that they I think they would win the league he's that good I think the as Harry says the only issue is the fitness that he does take you know sometimes a few long spells out with with injury and that's a bit of an issue but what I've noticed about Isak as well is when they first signed him he's got that lovely style hasn't he you know kind of like languid and the way he can take it round players as well he's got so much a striker but I think what I've seen this season is that he's also grown in strength as well he's he's kind of you know, we say it a lot about strikers that, that move from, from other countries, but he is adapted to the Premier League now. I think that we're looking at one of the best strikers in the league. I, I can't think of, you know, obviously Haaland, but then after that, I don't really think there's anyone else. I think he's better than Watkins uh, because, of, because of his finishing. I think Watkins is a fantastic player, but at times... You know, his finishing is left wanting a bit. He sometimes can miss chances. When it gets to Isak, you know, like you mentioned there with the first goal, even with the third goal as well, you just knew he was going to score. I literally just, I knew that we had taken the lead before he'd even suck it in the back of the net because his finishing is so lethal. And I think that's what put to, puts him ahead of some of the other strikers in the league. Is there an argument to say, Scott, just lastly on Isak, that Isak is the best one-on-one -on -one finisher in the league? 
because Haaland gets a lot of chances. I don't think Izak, and even judging by this 20% of possession at the weekend, the amount of chances Izak gets, I'd love to know his chance conversion rate because Haaland's got a constant supply line of chances all the time. Nunes is a good example, gets constant chances all the time. Even Havertz, Jesus, etc. There's always supply. And it's no disrespect to Newcastle, but the amount of chances Izak gets is nowhere near comparable, in my opinion, to those teams. And when he gets chances, you rarely see him miss. Mm. Like, if you actually look at his shot placement, he always seems to find or pick the right spot yeah. mm. on every chance. Is there an argument to say that he is the best finisher in the Premier League? There's an argument to say it. I just... Do you think he is? No, I, I'd still have Haaland ahead of him, I think. Uh, but... In terms of Isaac and his finishing, he, like he does remind me of Henri as well. You you always seem to know what, exactly what he's going to do, and you just can't seem to stop it. Like even when he he got the ball for like the first goal the other day, and Van der Ven fell over, like you knew exactly what movement he was trying to make, mm. and like obviously Van der Ven was probably expecting it as well, but he couldn't keep up with it and end up falling over. Mm. But he just really really clinical. And he's only 23, yeah, 24 very young, very ish. Young. He's so just got plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, to be, I think to be in with a shout, in with a shout of the Golden Boot, given the season Newcastle have had, is, is testament to it as well. Like yeah, you say, sure. he rarely ever misses. And uh, that was, yeah, he loves playing Tottenham as well, which I very much enjoy. Can I just also say, Anthony Gordon was absolutely superb again. Um, and, you know, heading into to this summer, I can't believe they were even questions before he obviously got his call up for the friendlies but before that hadn't been able to get himself a look into this squad but given his form throughout the the whole season and I feel like that is a it's so tough with England isn't it because there, there's just so much talent but he should he's definitely pushing for a starting place in, in the England team for me for sure. this summer yeah for sure. it's been superb Harry just just before I forget mm. Arsenal have the chance to sign Watkins Tony or Isaac who should they sign Tony no Never been interested in Ivan Tony, not in the slightest, um, for reasons I won't get into now. Um, but it's tough because what like I think Isaac is the better footballer than Ollie Watkins. Mm. I think he's got a higher ceiling than Ollie Watkins, and I think he's Isaac has got the potential to go on and be one of the world's best. Watkins doesn't have that level to go into for me. He's at his absolute peak at the minute, but it's the fitness thing that makes me lean towards Watkins because he's so much more robust. And I don't know, I've just been burnt by watching my club bring players in that are supremely talented but can't stay fit. And I don't know. Yeah. Kim Kalstrom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, Kim Kalstrom came to Arsenal with a fracture in his back. <laughs> he was signed with that problem. It's like, what were they doing? <laughs> <laughs> What were they doing? <laughs> I'm trying to think of some other rogue Arsenal chats. Eduardo. Uh, Eduardo was good, to be fair. It was that mm. nasty Eduardo. challenge. Yeah, Martin Taylor. Mm. Done awful. awful. United, Scott, we're going to wrap up today's show. Section in Manchester United. Finally, some fun. For the first <laughs> time in Premier League history, Manchester United are at risk of finishing below seventh in careful, the Premier League. Careful. Because he's going to do a Ten Hag if you ask him about that and get up and walk off. <laughs> <laughs> if there's the Ten Hag. If that, the, I, if that's not it? fair. I, th I think he's, been, he's copped a lot of flack for that. But <laughs> the not. press conference was already over. The, the press officer had already said, well, okay, that's enough questions. You can hear the journalist just at the end going, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott, um... Well, he looks forlorn, Jake. He, yeah, he does look yeah. forlorn. Where I mean, are you? Where are you at as a Manchester United fan now? I just find it funny, like just but genuinely. What is like many United fans lose their mind at every time United play a game, and it's as bad as it looks as it was against Bournemouth. But what are you expecting? Are you expecting it to magically be different? This is what the style of play that they're going for, and it is very high risk, and it just doesn't work at the moment with these players. And whether you say that whether Ten Hag gets next season and he gets to have different players. Obviously, the back four thing is, a, is an issue, but like that, the time for excuses went a long time ago. United should not be playing as badly as they are and they should not be as low in the league as they are. Um, Conference Scott, a Bajan Pops has been calling me Conference Scott for the entire show in the comments. Maybe he wants a conference with you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think it's, it's in reference to United going, th going through the Europa Conference League or seventh or eighth or whatever that is. But yeah, they, they are very much at risk because Newcastle are playing better at the moment. Newcastle got a decent run in and they've gone above United now. Yeah, uh, well. yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chelsea are only six points behind with two games in hand. 
And Chelsea have had an awful season. So if they finish beneath Chelsea, good God, like mm. that's terrible. And there's other Newcastle teams. Newcastle have still got to play Man United away as well. Yeah. So, yeah. That, so yeah. you know, United have got a run in, which is, uh, I think the, the entire season is really on the FA Cup. I put a poll out the other day on mm. my, my Twitter whether people would prefer United qualify for the Europa League or just nothing nothing in Europe at all. And I think the, the larger part of the vote was for no European football at all. Uh, United need a big reset. Eric Ten Hag is trying to employ tactics which are just not working with the players that he's got. And whether they work in general, if, even if he has different players, remains to be seen. I think there's a lot of doubt over it. He's smirking at me. You've always said Eric Ten Hag has not had a style. But yeah. he does have a style. It's just, it's just terrible. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a monetization comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, Scott, um, we have to touch on one of the big stories after the uh, Bournemouth draw, which was Alejandro Garnacho liking Mark Goldbridge's tweets. Uh, Criticising, is that the fair Ten Hogs? Decision to uh, sort of his management of him, etc. What do you make of that whole situation? Is that... S- does that sort of sum up the situation Manchester United are in at this Sums moment in time? Sums up the entire season, really. The fact that the season mm. started with Jadon Sandro putting a tweet out going against his manager. Defending himself. Def- defending himself, but also calling his manager a liar, which yeah. is what he did. And now he's in the Bundesliga. Whatever's happening at Dortmund is happening at Dortmund. He's in the Champions League, isn't he? I think, <laughs> I think it summarises the, the problem that United have culturally. Right, The fact that players feel empowered enough mm. to go and either put a tweet out which is defying their manager publicly or Garnacho is smart enough to know that, hey, people are going to see this. People are going to see me defying my manager. Even if he's not coming out and saying something, he is still showing that he is against or he doesn't agree with what his manager's told him. Sort it out in private, behind closed doors and keep the problems out of the limelight but the problem with United is the fact that they have been run so poorly and players have been given so much power over the last few years has allowed this player power to fester and nobody in that dressing room feels like they can't express themselves even if it's in uh, defying the manager it's just really I'm tired of it I'm really bored of it I think Garnacho should come back from it like he maybe sort it out behind closed doors as long as you sort it out and you feel like you know, apologize to the manager again if that's what's necessary in Ten Hag's mind. Just stop making public statements, either directly or indirectly, which defy your manager. Because at the end of the day, right, the manager is the manager, right? And if he if he's going to lose his job, he's going to lose his job, and then you can move on. But until that point, he's he started him for thirty games in a row, Jakey. Thirty games in a row. Mm. If I'm Manchester United and it's a choice out of Garnacho and Ten Hag, I know who I'm picking every day of the week. Ten Hag. <laughs> Absolutely bloody not. He's a great manager. Um, isn't he? yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's fantastic. Look, I hope he signs a new contract and stays for the next five years. Um, but Scott, you've he's been won as many trophies as Mikel Arteta. You've been so re- <laughs> yeah, he's the great Manchester United, isn't it? The, the, Rod- great, the greatest the great Arsenal Manchester team in twenty years. Brendan Rodgers. Do you remember when they were celebrating? Do you remember when they were celebrating that they signed Lisandro Martinez and we didn't get him? <laughs> I'd actually say, yeah, exactly. the, to be fair, I actually think that's of all the signings, Harry, he's the one who's been off. <laughs> 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 I had to get one right. Yeah, the, yeah, there's <laughs> other examples, <laughs> mate. Yeah, yeah. No, the point was, <laughs> and the point was, that, no, was that was one that we went that's directly head to head for. And they were celebrating mm. the fact that he's come to Man United over Arsenal and he spent the whole time on the sideline. But you mark a player's injury. Scott, you've been so reluctant to say Eric Ten Hag needs to be sacked. Even now, you're toeing the party line and you're saying, oh, you know, this and that. And What is it going to take for you to sit here and say, Eric Ten Hag needs to go? What is it going to take for Scott Saunders to get out his yellow and green scarf and sit here and say, Eric Ten Hag's got to go? Yellow I, and green scarf? Yeah. Because the they're still there. Huh? The, the Glazers are still there. They're still there, but they're not in control of the football and aspect of the club. Well, they're in control of the football club because they still own the majority of it. This is what I've been saying all along. You look into along. the fine print, Harry. The, pe- the people who are making these changes, they have a new CEO, they have a new sporting director coming, and they have a new technical director coming, pro- possibly a new head of recruitment, which is what I've been saying all along needs to change. Yeah, but we've always said that, yeah, they can give the football in control, but they still have financial control, and they will limit the football in operation by the fact that they're still going to take their dividends and they're still going to do what they do. So until they're gone, there's only so much that Jim Ratcliffe can do. I, I get that. 
What is it going to take for you? <laughs> we'll go back to my question. Stop deflecting. Hey, Harry, you what tried. Is it gonna <laughs> take for you, right? What is it going to take for you to sit here and say Eric Ten Hag should be sacked? Because I, if you finish below Chelsea, my God, mm. like that is like that is. Would you go far to as catastrophic? Absolutely. You could not defend that in any way, shape, or form. What is what has got to happen for you to go? Where have they got to finish? Has they got to, like what's got to happen? Uh, for Harry, you to that get point to that isn't going to come. I, I'm at the point now where I can't defend Eric Ten Hag anymore. So I'm not going to come out and defend the football that we're seeing, the fact that it is that bad, the fact that they could have their worst league finish of all time. There are so many circumstances around the manager which need to be addressed, and that will happen this summer. Whether Ineos feel like one of the alternative managers that are out there on the market at the moment can do a better job, and maybe they can. But I'm telling you now, Graham Potter is not an inspiring appointment. I'm not going to sit here ultimately and say, Eric Ten Hag, get out of the club because I would prefer anybody else to be but in But hold charge. on a minute. But th this is the thing. We go back to the Jim Ratcliffe thing again. A few months ago, it was Sir Jim Ratcliffe's going to save Man United and turn us around. <laughs> and now you don't like the manager that it looks most likely they're going to go and get. So, like... I'm not, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I'm not going to actively come out and support it. Like... If they make so that you're decision, just gonna, I'll get behind So you're it. basically just going to say nothing. You're not going to say that Eric Ten Hag should be sacked. <laughs> not everybody not has to. The manager. Not everybody you're has to. You're just going to say nothing. <laughs> you're just going to sit there and laugh at Man United every weekend. And that's it. Yeah, for the rest of your Harry, life. It, I know in this world that we have to make massive statements about which are in one direction or another. I need some commitment here. <laughs> I need okay, some but commitment. do you know what the question would be, Scott? What manager appointment... And Ollie can maybe throw a few names out. What managerial appointment for Manchester United next season, assuming Ten Hag does leave, would inspire you as a Manchester United fan? I would United take fan? Julian Nagelsmann. I would take him. Mm. Whether they can get him is Who Unai Emery? Guess. No. I what? I really? No, the guy that you said is going to be manager of the season? At Aston Villa. I've seen him and will his, to Arsenal well, Aston previously. Villa, who were fourth. I've seen him will to Arsenal United previously. Uh, with, with all due respect <laughs> to Aston Villa, <laughs> Man United, I know they're competing for fourth at the moment and not getting it. Man United got to compete for the Premier League title. And whether do I think Unai Emery can get United competing for the Premier League title? No, I don't. Next se but for next season, though, I think he's all his point. Mm. I mean, Unai Emery, United aren't in a position where I think next season you even put them in the top pitch, you put them in the top four pitcher mm. to try and get fourth. Mm. Are you, so but, you're, like, but you're saying that Unai Emery couldn't even get them to the, that level beyond and into a title race? Maybe, but... Even uh, without Klopp at Liverpool? <laughs> I don't know. As long as, Pep's, as, long as, long as Pep's at Man City, I don't think... There's many teams who have a chance. Do you know what? Shout out to show. He, he put a super chat in. Good to see him out. I know he's a, he's a long time viewer of the channel. Uh, two uh, United fan as well. 241 shots faced in the last 10 games for United. 575 total this season. 17 defeats. Minus one goal difference. Only 45 goals scored in the league. Horrible. Get this manager out. How are you going to fit to that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I just, I just want a bit of commitment. You said I'll, I'll take Nagelsmann, but you didn't say I would love Nagelsmann or I would back Nagelsmann. I would take him. It's like you're tempering it. You're preparing. What, what you're asking me to do is say that the manager is solely responsible for everything that you see. No, no, no. Regarding no, no. the out output of the football club, and that's not the case. No, because you know, I need a structure, and then if that structure comes in and they decide this manager is the best person for the job, fine. I'll take it. I'm not asking you to say that Eric Ten Hag is solely responsible. I'm asking you to accept <laughs> his role in the shit show that has been Manchester United season and not keep... I have. You I haven't. Have. You, I have. You just said that you won't call for him to be sacked. So yeah, you like, ha that, that does. I don't have to call for him to be sacked to accept that he's responsible for what we're seeing on the pitch. Because last season, when you were saying he doesn't have a style of play, it was because he didn't have the players to play the style of play that he wants. And you could probably argue now that the style of play that he wants to play, which he is playing, is not very good because of the players he's got. So he had to change his style of play last season to protect the defence more. And United got a lot of 1-0s. They got a lot of results where they kept clean sheets. And he was getting criticised at that point for winning a Carabao Cup and finishing third in the league, which is what Jurgen Klopp could do this season. Right? And now he's tried to progress Man United to a point where we see more of a style of play which is more akin to Ajax. He's obviously got Casemiro who can't run. He's got central defenders. like He's got Willy Cambuala in there who's 19. Harry Maguire who he tried to sell last summer. He doesn't have a left back either. So all of these factors play into the fact that he, he the style of play that you're seeing on the pitch is not very good. If you replace those players with actual players who can execute the style of play, maybe we see an upturn. Maybe. I can't guarantee that we will. But, you know, 
I don't know where I'm going with this. There's a, there's a lot of feds sitting there. Man. Rajesh CFC says, Harry, how many... <laughs> this is a real sidetrack. Rajesh CFC, Harry, how many trophyless seasons would it take? So this, this, <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just come second and we'll get a champion. No, this, this, finals, this, lads. This, goes to, this goes to Ollie's point earlier that uh, you can't God, always decide me. where a team is at purely based on the trophy return. Mm. So I'm not even sitting here going on about Eric Ten Hag needs to win trophies. And it's you almost just, well, it's the reverse for Man yeah. United, isn't it? If he won the FA Cup, what you'd still want him to be the manager, surely? Me, would Louis you? Van Gaal won the if FA he won Cup. The FA I'm, Cup. I'm, I'm apathetic to the situation. <laughs> I'm apathetic to it. <laughs> Man United are a mess. They're a hot mess of a football club. That they, they need players changing. They possibly need, need a manager changing, and they need people above the manager to change as well. Until that happens, it's going to take long. It'll take a long time. It's not going to be a magic fix where. No. Hey, let's. Oh, Nagelsmann's come in and he's magically fixed everything. They're getting the, they're getting ninety five points a season. It's not going to be that. It won't be that. So, if they are making a decision on the manager for the sake of it, when there's candidates out there that they're just thinking, oh, it's, let's just make a change for the sake of making a change. What are you giggling at? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> all the time. Some of the comments. I'm trying to talk here and I can't talk. Um, <laughs> Let's wrap up today because we have gone, for, gone on for a little while. It's been, it's been a good show. I enjoyed it. Uh, it's, 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 Scott was going to keep going there. Um, huge congrats to, to Bayer Leverkusen. I'm sure Xabi Alonso is watching this. Um, winning, the, winning, the, winning the Bundesliga. Amazing story, to be fair. Yeah. And it uh, looks like he's well, he's going to be there for another season. Then he's going to take the Madrid job, probably. So, or the Man United job. <laughs> Would you take Alonso? Well, he's not leaving, is he? No, but would you take... Let's just say, hypothetically, Alonso was available. Would you have taken him? No, nah, he's played for Liverpool. <laughs> 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 and I guess the best place to wrap up, Ollie, is your Jim White impression. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, well, it's great to have you on board, everyone. And what a conversation we've had. But, Scott, where are Manchester United? Where is Eric Ten Hag? Get your calls in. Simon Jordan starts next. <laughs> so, I love you, Jim. I love you, Jim. Oh, Highlight of the it's show. It's the laugh best. that kills me. Yeah. It's the laugh that absolutely ruins me. I've heard he's got Daniel oh. Farker in the locker as well. I'd like to save that for another time. Another time. Only what a pleasure, Scott, Harry, myself, Jakey. What a pleasure. Thanks so much to everybody who watched. They really did enjoy that. A lot to get into. <laughs> if you could leave a like on the way out, it'd be massively appreciated. Share this video. Subscribe tonight. I'm in for Ollie. Does some great stuff. Talk Sports very own. Harry's also technically Talk Sports very own as well. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we, we don't see it that way. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> 90 minutes, Harry Simeon. Yeah. Follow Scott, follow myself. <laughs> and at 90 minutes underscore football. And we will see you in the next one. Take care, guys.